record. All right. So I'm recording this chat session just for those that are going to be on watch specifically or those that had emergencies to attend to. Okay. All right. So let's start with chapter nine, airway management. This specific chapter can be summarized into three, um, three basic concepts, open, clear, secure. That's your three major concepts, open, clear, secure. And then um, we're going to go ahead and gonna co cover that one by one. Okay. I'm guessing we're not getting a visual. No, you're not getting a visual tonight. No, you're not. Now I'll open my cam here shortly. Okay, so let's start with the airway physiology. So your airway has been divided into upper and lower airway, okay? So your upper airway, starting from the mouth and nose all the way up, okay, all the way up to your larynx, okay? So I'm gonna repeat that again. Mouth and nose all the way up to your larynx, and then anything below the larynx, which is only several parts. You have your trachea, your bronchi, your bronchioles, and your alveoli all belong to the lower airway. So mouth, nose, nasopharynx, oropharynx, hypopharynx, larynx all belong to the upper airway. Um, a patent airway, we already know from mod one, patent airway basically means a, um, an open and clear airway, okay? So, Another thing that a lot of people, I was looking at y'all's homework and chapter tests between cricoid ring and a uh, cricoid cartilage and thyroid cartilage. So let me just differentiate the two. So the thyroid cartilage is the one that is on the front of the larynx, which basically forms your Adam's apple. Okay, so that is your um, thyroid cartilage. So every time you hear thyroid cartilage, I want you guys to automatically relate that to Adam's apple. So if you're taking notes, thyroid cartilage equals Adam's apple. The cricoid ring, that's basically, that's below, right below the, um, right below the um, thyroid cartilage. And it's about, it's right um, the big, at the beginning of the trachea. Okay, so those are the two main difference because a lot of you guys that especially for those of you that did the study plans you guys were confusing those two things okay so again thyroid cartilage adam's apple cricoid cartilage or cricoid ring that's basically below um the larynx okay and it's just right above the trachea okay is everybody clear with that one thumbs up if you guys are on cams good 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 right so let's move on um we also have new terms here um the carina carina is basically the one in the middle of um uh, right below the trachea before it um, separates into the bronchi we have the carina okay and then in the alveoli we already know that the alveoli is where gas exchange takes place through the process called diffusion okay so that's how oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged through um, the process of respiration, okay? So that's basically your airway physiology. Any questions with air physiology class? Perfecto. Okay, moving on. Airway pathophysiology. This specific paragraph just basically talks about what would compromise airway. Well, we have several things. Um, obstruction is number one, right? This is a very common thing. Obstructions comes in different ways, shapes, and form. Um, it could be an obstruction because of a food blockage. It could be an object obstructing it, right? Or it could be also the anat anatomical body part that's blocking it. For example, Somebody who has a decreased mental status, um, they have a tendency, their, um, the, lower, the muscles of their lower jaw tends to relax, causing the tongue to fall back. And when that happens, the tongue, covers the um, the tongue causes the epiglottis to basically shut off. Well, so what if the epiglottis shuts off? Well, what does the epiglottis cover? The trachea, right? So if the epiglottis shuts off the trachea, airway is not going to be able to enter. So that's why patients that are have an altered mental status or those that have a, those that are unconscious have a susceptibility or a probability of them getting their airway completely shut off, okay? And then we also have a new term called bronchoconstriction. Bronchoconstriction is where your air, um, the muscles of your bronchioles basically tighten up. They're decreasing in diameter. So this is common for those individuals that have asthma, okay? So that is your bronchoconstriction. So how do, I, how do you identify if the patient has a patent airway? Well, you already did this in your labs earlier, the BVM of an apneic patient, checking for responsiveness, sir, are you okay? Okay, and then you also have um, checking for breathing by looking, listening, and feeling for no more, um, five to 10 seconds. So you're looking for visible chest rise, you're listening for breath sounds, okay, and we're gonna talk about the different types of sounds here later on. You're gonna feel if there's any type of air moving out of the airway, 
And you're also considering what are possible things that could cause the airway to shut down again, um, if ever. Because, for example, if I got, a, got into a car accident, okay, um, just because I'm talking to you doesn't mean that I'm going to be fine the whole time. I can, my airway can shut off any minute because blood can start forming up in my airway. Question from the chat box, what is a smooth muscle? Remember when we talk about mod one, there's different types of smooth muscles, right? Smooth muscles um, and skeletal muscles. So smooth muscles are the ones that you don't have to control, such as the muscles inside your bronchioles, such as the muscles inside your digestive tract. So it's, you don't have to tell your bronchioles or your, the muscles inside your respiratory system to open and close up. It does it on its own. Does, okay. that, does that answer your question, Williams? Yes, it is. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Right. All right. So moving on. So those are the things that you, will, you would use to assess the airway. So what are some signs of inadequate airway? So signs of inadequate airway, obviously, there's no rise and fall of the chest. I'm a person who is unable to speak, somebody who has hoarseness in their voice, and these sounds on page 198, right? Strider, hoarseness, snoring, and gurgling. So strider is the high-pitched sound, the <gasps> so those, that's high-pitched strider. Then you have the hoarseness, basically a change in the voice. Um, snoring, basically indicating a partial obstruction. So yes, individuals that do snore in their sleep has the potential for having sleep apnea, right? Or inability to um, breathe while they're sleeping. And then you also have gurgling, which is basically a fluid obstruction in the airway. And for those of you in the chat box, or for those of you and you're using your cell phones, feel free to shout the answer. If you are, if you hear gurgling, you should automatically start what? Or what should so, be- yeah. Suction, very good. Suction, 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 and gurgling. Okay, you want to equate that to fluids. Okay, so for pediatric patients, pediatric patients, there's two very prominent signs when it comes to pediatric patients um, when there is inadequate airway. Okay, this is actually a sign of respiratory failure, such, and those are the retractions and nasal flaring. Okay, so when common for pediatric patients are retractions on the clavicles and right below the ribs or in the abdominal area and nasal flaring, okay, specifically for your pediatric patients, okay? Any questions about assessing the airway? Everybody good? Cool, 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 awesome. Right, now let's talk about opening the airway. Remember I told you that this chapter has three main concepts to it, open, clear, and secure. Y'all are so needy, fine, 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 start video. There you go, you happy now? Okay, I know, I am very, I know, I'm good looking, I know y'all need to see this beautiful mod, model face. All right, let's start with the open, clear, and secure. Okay, so opening and clearing and securing the airway. So opening the airway, there's only two ways that we're gonna open the airway. This is through the head tilt chin lift and the jaw thrust maneuver, easy day. The head tilt chin lift, if there's no suspected spinal injury, right? No suspected spinal injury at all, I can use the head tilt chin lift. Um, earlier in the lab, y'all were making up different terms, head tilt maneuver or whatever. Okay, so head tilt, chin lift, no spinal injury. Okay, um, the other way to open the airway is through the jaw thrust maneuver. Okay, the jaw thrust maneuver is for individuals that have suspected. Okay, again, suspected. It doesn't have, that means that I don't need to see the spine injured. All I need is a suspicion that they have an injured spine. Okay then I can use the jaw thrust maneuver. So for example, let me give you guys a scenario. Uh, I came into the scene and I see a construction worker. Um, he's unconscious right, right by a ladder. Would I use a head tilt chin lift or would I use a jaw thrust maneuver? Jaw thrust maneuver. <laughs> jaw thrust maneuver. Thank you, Duplessis. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> So yes, jaw thrust maneuver is the one that we're gonna use because you have a possible suspicion that, hey, this guy might have fallen and it's rather to be safe than sorry. So that is, those are your two ways of opening your airway, head tilt, chin lift, and jaw thrust maneuver. Um, are there any questions about that? Okay, good. So next we have the um, securing the airway. Okay, so when we open the airway, we're gonna skip the clearing the airway here shortly because I'm following over the book so that you guys are following through your pages. So when we're securing the airway, once we've cleared it through the suction, we wanna secure the airway. So there's only two ways of how you're gonna secure your airway. That's the oropharyngeal airway, OPA, 
and you have the nasopharyngeal airway. So let's talk about those real quick. So oropharyngeal airway, there are several things that needs to happen. Okay, this is specifically for those individuals that are unconscious. Okay, unconscious, un unresponsive, and does not have a gag reflex. That's that's your two biggest things. Okay, right. <clears throat> and then, why does the meeting have a fifty participant max? Oh, is that what it says? Fix fifty is the maximum. I don't believe that. Okay, I'll fix that on our on our on our, in a few minutes here. I'm pretty sure I set it to 200 individuals. Okay, I'll look at I'll look that up on our next break. All right, so for oropharyngeal airway, and then you're um, basically no gag reflex, unconscious, right? And then you want to make sure that you're measuring it properly. So let's talk about measuring it. You want to measure it from the tip of the earlobe, right, to the um, corner of the mouth. That's the best way to do it. When we're inserting it, the textbook specifically says when you're inserting it, it's 180 or the alternative is 90 degree, right? So when you're inserting it and then you twist it when you come in there, just like what we did in our lab, all of us teaches the... Nine, uh, 90 degree because it's the easiest way, but the textbook still wants you to know that 180 is, um, 180 is also an option, okay? Um, every time you do the OPA, you always want to do the cross finger technique when you're opening their mouth. So that's for an adult. When you're doing it on a pediatric patient, okay, when you're doing it on a pediatric patient, there's one thing that's special or two things that's special about it. One, I don't have to twist the OPA. I just basically insert it right away. And then another thing, since they have a larger surface area on their tongue, I kind of need to put that out of the way. In order for me to do that, I could use a tongue depressor or the rigid suction tips, the ones that we used on earlier for, um, in the lab, right? So those are the two ways that we could move the tongue out of the way for a pediatric patient, okay? And another thing about the oropharyngeal airway, those flanges, and a lot, I hit a couple of you on this one earlier in lab, you want to make sure that the flange, okay, the edge of those OPAs is resting on the lips, not the gums, not the teeth, resting on the lips, okay? Right, so if your patient did um, have a gag reflex when you're inserting it, are you gonna continue on? Are you just gonna like, well, you know what? I'm just gonna shove this OPA in their mouth. Are we gonna continue on if we do have a gag reflex? Negatory, no. Yep. negatory. No, 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 that's a big no-no. You're not gonna insert an OPA um, if they do have a possible gag reflex because you're gonna cause that person to have an aspiration. Basically, they're gonna throw up, they're gonna swallow their own vomit, and that's possibly gonna go into their trachea. So now you're compromising their airway um, a lot more. Okay, so that's for your oropharyngeal airway. Any questions on that class? You're good, just making sure. Okay, all right, I'm gonna move on. Nasopharyngeal airway, the second way, uh, the second basic airway adjunct that we're gonna use. So nasopharyngeal airway, this is pretty, um, this is more preferred for those individuals that are conscious or semi-conscious, right? So for those of you in the Bravo class, remember the little demonstration that I had? Did I, you know, I didn't have any gag reflex, okay? Will we need to know flat? Okay, yes, every time I'm telling you everything that's on the textbook, you need to know, yes. Everything that we're going over, okay? All right, so for the nasopharyngeal airway, as you notice, when, um, when the nasopharyngeal was inserted, there was no gag reflex present, right? Because it doesn't touch the um, majority of the oropharynx because it's going through the nasopharynx. That's why this is preferred if your patient is somewhat semi-conscious or um, co completely conscious, right? Um, the only thing is, this is contraindicated. So when I, you hear the word contraindicated, that basically means when should you not, okay? When should you not? So contraindicated means the, the, a big no-no, okay? So what are the big no-nos for nasopharyngeal airway? Well, one, if they have a CSF, right? A cerebrospinal fluid coming out of their ears or nose, okay? Because this can indicate a skull fracture, okay? So, so what if there's a possible skull fracture? Well, the brain and the nasopharynx, if you look at it anatomically, they're, they're literally close to each other. So if you insert a nasopharynx and they have a possible skull injury, then you, there's possible brain matter that's exposed that if, you, if the nasopharynx touches that brain matter, it could cause the brain to swallow, right? So that's why you don't want to insert a nasopharyngeal airway, 
Well, HM1, so what if they have a gag reflex and they also have a skull fracture? So what do I do now? Do you just forget about your patient and say deuces? Mm, not necessarily. That's why you need to contact advanced life support. And those are the individuals such as your paramedics and advanced EMT um, that are going to insert the advanced airways that we are going to talk about in chapter 10, right? So all you can do, honestly, is provide BVM, 100% concentration oxygen, and transport your patient right away if they have a gag reflex and they have a um, CSF. Makes sense, everyone? All right, so let's talk about measuring it. Same thing, instead of measuring it to the um, tip of the earlobe, you're going to measure it on the corner of the nose or the tip of the nostril, right? And then you're going to measure it at... Um, from the tip of the um, from the tip of the earlobe. Sorry, so tip the earlobe to the corner of the nostril instead of the corner of the mouth, right? And you want to make sure that the bevel is facing toward the septum, right? And you want to make sure that you put it on a clear nasal passage, right? Because your nostrils are not equal. One of them has a like a little crevice that's going to cause some blockage on there. Okay, so that's how you're going to measure a nasopharyngeal airway. And yes, you're not going to put it in dry in the nostril. That's going to cause a lot of bleeding. So you want to make sure that you lube it up using a water lubricant, or you can use the patient's saliva if you have to. Okay, not your saliva, because that's nasty. All right, any questions, ever? anybody? No questions. Everybody good with the uh, phones? I know you guys are like listening to a radio station for those of you in the cell phone. All right, let's go to everybody good. Everybody good with the opening? Okay, so we talked about opening the airway, um, head tilt, chin lift, jaw thrust maneuver. We talked about securing the airway, oropharyngeal airway, and nasopharyngeal airway, as well as when to measure them, when to use them, when not to use them. Now let's talk about clearing the airway. This is a very important concept because when you hear some gurgling, when there's fluids in the mouth, vomit in the mouth, blood in the mouth, you have to clear that airway because the airway is not considered patent if that's the case. So what about suctioning? Well, there's several things that we are need to consider for suctioning. First off, how good is our suctioning device? Well, first off, it has to be, have the ability to vacuum 300 millimeters mercury or 300 mmHg and it needs to be able to collect an air intake of 30 liters per minute. So those are your magical numbers right there, 300 mmHg and 30 LPM. That's how I know that I have a very good suction device, okay? Um, so what are the parts of this thing? Uh, what are the parts of the um, such, uh, a suction unit, right? Whether it's mounted or whether it's portable, they all have the same, um, t they all have the same equipment, right, or parts to it. Right, so one of them is called the um, rigid pharyngeal tip or the rigid suction tip. Okay, this is also known as the yank carer, um, the tonsil sucker, or the tonsil tip suction. These are the ones that you all use in the lab. Okay, so this is um, the one that we usually use because it's a lot bigger. Okay, it's a lot bigger. It can it can suck a lot more fluids, right, and some particles. But you have to be very careful with this. The reason why is because part of our rule is you're only going to suction till you see the tip. Once the tip disappears, that's dangerous because you can accidentally trigger the vagus nerve. So what if I trigger the vagus nerve, HM1? I've never even heard of the vagus nerve. Well, the vagus nerve can slow down the heart, and it's right here inside your, somewhere in there in your knee, um, oral pharynx. So that's why you only suction until you see the tip. Another thing that you can activate is the gag reflex. So if you're suctioning vomit and then you trigger the gag reflex, it could cause them to vomit more. So that's why you want to be careful when you're using the rigid suction tip. Um, another thing that we have, if you don't have a suction tip, is the suction catheter. The suction catheter is quite different because it's a lot thinner, a lot more flexible, and you can use it in smaller passages such as in an NPA or in a stoma. That's the surgical opening in the neck if you want to clean that one out. Um, so that's the main use of the suction catheter. Um, sometimes, however, there's very large particles that's not going to be able to go into the suction unit. So what you want to do is have a large bore catheter, and it's simply done sometimes you removing that suction tip can give you a large bore. So it'll be able, you'll be able to suction more on that one, okay? And if things starts to clog up, that's why you have a uh, sterile water to basically clear up the tubing if there's a lot of clogging that's happening on there, okay? So 
Um, that's for your suction parts and suction devices. Any questions for that class? All right, so now let's talk about the techniques, right, or the three rules as I like to call it. There's only three rules when it comes to suctioning, okay? So these three rules, first rule, PPE. Right, the, the first thing that you do in every lab, BSI is my scene safe. BSI basically means body substance isolation or putting on the proper PPE. For this one, what would you need? Goggles, right, masks, gloves, obviously, to protect yourself just in case things start to spill, okay, or splash. So that's the first rule, PPE. Second rule, suction no more than, very good, 10 seconds, right? 10 seconds. 15 is also acceptable for those of you that are taking national registry, specifically my Air Force personnel. 10 to 15 is allowed. For testing purposes, however, we're going to stick with 10 seconds, okay? Uh, and then, last but not least, the third rule is only suction on the way out, okay? You only want to suction on the way out. This is the whole reason why we kink the tubing when we're um, inserting it, and we unkink it when we're releasing it. Okay, so <clears throat> that's your three rules for suctioning. Um, I, I was also looking at some of you who answered some of the um, exercises on the study plan. Um, the best position for suctioning is actually on the patient's side. And why is that? Because when a patient throws up, okay, just like your friends who gets too drunk, okay, when you leave them laying down, what happens is they can accidentally, when they're sleeping, can you throw up when you're asleep? Yes or no? Yes, right? So just imagine somebody who's laying supine and throws up, they can easily swallow their own vomit and cause them to aspirate on it. So that's why when you're suctioning a patient, it's preferred that they're on the side, but if you're going to keep them in the supine, that's also okay. Okay, but if you can, you can try, uh, suctioning is best delivered, it says on your book on page 210, suctioning is best delivered with the patient turned on the side, okay? Um, just like your NPA, if you see some skull frag or if there's like brain matter exposed on there, just be careful not to probe on those like brain matter that is exposed. Um, you still have to suction, obviously, but just be careful not to suction the brain matter. So again, I don't want you to confuse, oh my gosh, brain matter, I can't suction. Well, you still want to suction the fluid. You just have to be very careful if, it, if it's showing on the um, nasopharynx or the oropharynx area. Okay, so any questions with that class? All right, so we have open, clear, secure. So we already talked about open, head tilt, chin lift, jaw thrust maneuver, clear by suctioning no more than, 15, no more than 10 seconds, 300 millimeters per mercury, 30 liters per minute. Okay, and we talked about the three rules with suctioning, PPE. Um, we um, suction no more than 10 seconds and suction on our way out. And then we also talked about securing the airway, OPA, oropharyngeal airway, no gag reflex, and preferably for unconscious and unresponsive, and the NPA, which for those individuals that, are, um, that do not have a CSF or do not have skull, uh, skull fractures, and those, that do, um, those individuals that are also semi-conscious or fully conscious, okay? Any questions so far, class? H and one. When using the NPA, do you still have to suction, or is that only when you use the uh, OPA? Well, um, when you open the airway, uh, it depends. When you open the airway, right, via head tilt, chin lift, or jaw thrust maneuver, if you see blood in the um, if you see blood in the nasopharynx or the oropharynx, you you will still have to suction. Okay, so regardless. Um, you, would, uh, you would always suction if there's any blockage in the airway. Does that answer your question, Alvarado? Yes, no, okay, good. Make sure you reply to me, because I'm that person. If you don't reply to me, and I reply to you right away, I'm gonna bug you. Hey, you there, you alive? Okay, all right. <clears throat> Let's talk about the last section. Okay, last section, special considerations. There's uh, four special considerations on here. First one is facial injuries. When your patient has a facial injury, let's say a lot of lacerations or like a blunt force trauma on the face, you want to you want to assume automatically there, there's going to be a lot of blood that can cause some blockage in the airway because your face has a lot of nerves, okay? There's a lot of nerves in your face, and any type of trauma to the face can cause a lot of um, blood obstructions in the airway, okay? And the second special consideration are obstructions in your airway. Um, in mod three, 
you're going to learn how to relieve obstruction from infants, from children, and from adults when they are choking on something. Um, so that's basically that specific paragraph right there. So when somebody's um, when there's obstruction, you can do abdominal thrusts, chest thrusts, or you can do the back slaps and five chest thrusts for infants. But we're going to talk more on that on uh, around uh, after mod three when we talk about BLS. Okay. And the third one are dental appliances. These are specifically for Granny Smith and Grandpa Jones, the ones that are wearing dentures. Okay. If the dentures are not interrupting your suctioning at all. So if they're fully sticking to their mouth, do not take it off. Do not remove it. Leave it in place. However, if it's coming loose, if it's getting loose, right, then that's the time then to remove it if it's interrupting with your insertion of the OPA or the suctioning. Okay. So that's for your dental appliances. And last but not the least, on page 211, hmm, that picture looks very familiar because you saw this in mod one as well, right? So pediatric note, you're going to keep seeing this in almost every mod. So for, I'm just going to repeat it again. For the infants and children, they have smaller mouths, smaller nose. Trach is a lot more flexible. That means we cannot hyperextend them just like what you do with adults. We cannot hyperextend Okay, for um, infants, that's why we only put them in the neutral position. Um, another thing is that their um, ribs and their cricoid cartilage are not fully developed. So that's also a danger when they get into car accidents or any type of traumatic injury. And when we're using a rigid tip, we also want to be careful since their mouth is a lot smaller, your chances of touching their um, oropharynx and activating the gag reflex can be activated easily. So these are the things that you have to know that you should already know too from mod one about your pediatric patients, okay? So uh, are there any questions at all about this chapter? Like chapter nine, I like chapter nine because it's pretty easy, straightforward, and I can easily summarize that in three words. Any questions at all, class? Nothing. Like you guys are ready to take the test now because you have no questions. Okay, let's take the test right now. Open book test. How, how about that one, everybody? Open book test. You guys go with that? Fuck no. Yes, not no, no. <laughs> you guys are high on crack if you guys think you're going to have an open book test. All right. So um, let's do a quick five. Me, okay. Jimon, have yes. a, um, the sack is about to close, so we're going to be kicked off with the computers and stuff until till we get back to our barracks. Okay, no problem. Um, if you get if the sack, um, just feel free to jump in. I'm gonna put everybody on a break, um, so um, so I can like open up. I don't know why it's maxing it out in 50 participants, but just stand by, everybody. Don't log off. Uh, we're gonna pick up with chapter 10. Good to go. Good to, Good to go. go. Thank All you, right. everyone. Yeah, no problem. What's the name of the larger catheter? Um, the lar it's just called, uh, Tobias, it's just the um, large bore. It's just called a large bore catheter, right? So you have the rigid, uh, it's, there's a rigid suction tip. You have a suction catheter, and then you have the large bore, okay? So those are your three types that you're going to be using when it comes to suctioning. Um, Alvarado, thyroid cartilage is the one that forms the Adam's apple. Right below it is the cricoid cartilage. Okay, it's still, it's the, it covers the lower part of the larynx and just right above the trachea. Oh, well, it says J. Joey Alvarado, so sorry, Davis. Maybe next time you should use your own name when you're chatting with somebody and stop catfishing people. How about that? Oh, told you. All right, let me guys put you guys on break and let me figure out this little thing. Um, I was unable to review chapter 10 homework test after taking it. Have you heard that was a common problem? Uh, is everybody having a problem reviewing chapter 10? No? All right, I'll take a look at that because you're not the first one. There's another person that emailed me. Just go to your results tab, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and take a look at that one as well. All right. I shall return. Um. 
Um, please mute your mics and do not play any music. This is going to be recorded. It's going to be annoying when they're listening to this. That's right, you bless you. Mute your mics, please. <laughs> <laughs> 